No. Okay, Senator Brock. So, so if you're a, you're a GA pilot in the north of Western Australia in the bush, um, you know you're, you're, you've got a station up there. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it would be in your interest. That you, you don't you don't take passengers. You um, you know you fly from station to station. You fly into town occasionally. It would be in your interest if you're in those circumstances to leave uh, the GA sector and and move to. Uh, RA Oz. So there's a there's a financial advantage in doing so. It depends on what it depends on what um, type of flying you want to do. For example, you're restricted to day to day visual flight rules, so no instrument flying. So the restrictions in the, if so if you're going to fly daytime um, uh, outside of controlled airspace uh, below a certain altitude, um, then. And, and you want to operate in that space, which is the space that was set up for, for Recreational Aviation Australia, for recreational pilots um, a, number, a long time ago, 10 years ago, I think, or possibly more, um, then that's a good space for you to operate in. And a number of recreational pilots would be doing just that. Um, but for those who want to operate a larger aircraft or take more passengers, so if, if I use your anecdote, Senator, if I may, and you're on a station and you want to, you want to take your family anywhere, well, that's not that's not on. Uh, we will limit you to one to one passenger. Um, we need to, and that's one of the protections that's in place in the recreational space: limited pa limited passenger carriage, limited weight, outside of controlled airspace, not flying at night. And these are, these are the protections that are in place, and they work quite effectively. And. Um, uh, Organisations like RAOs and the other self-administering organisations who spoke to this morning, uh, who have been who have been consulted extensively on those regulations, uh, are very comfortable with that regime, and are very comfortable in moving towards it. So, so Mr. Carmody, you you, you acknowledge that the the cost uh, cost is has an impact on where people end up in the in the jigsaw puzzle um, of of deciding whether to be you know in the RA Oz system or in the GA sector. So cost is an impact and, and I note yep. that in the submission to you, RA Oz, as I brought up mm. with them, mm -hmm. um, did um, factor in their significant loss of revenue um, if, um, if recreational pilot licence requirements were, were reduced. Uh, sorry, if, if, uh, if requirements for other pilots were reduced. Um, but how much of an impact? Like, mm. did, how did did CASA factor that into mm. its decision making process? Uh, no, Senator. Not as far not as far as I know. We started out in the recreational space ten years ago or so. Uh, Jonathan, uh, more, well more than ten years ago. Um, the it's always been recognised, and as, as uh, Mr. Carmody said before, that you um, the activities in which you can engage are reduced depending on the category of license you hold. We got all that. Yeah. And, and so the, the cost attendant on re engaging in an RAR's activity as opposed to a, a regular activity is something a, a participant needs to weigh. Is it worth it to me to be able to do more things and therefore pay more for it than it is to do fewer things or with greater restraints and pay less for it? Whether that continues that way on into the future remains to be seen, but that's certainly the way it's been. But have, uh, I guess the question is, the question for us is have we got the balance right? When we're hearing um, about a, a much sounds, and you can tell me if that's incorrect, sounds like a much more simpler, a, a more simple system in the US and the UK, um, uh, without the sectionalisation. I mean, it was described yeah. as privatisation earlier, um, of putting people into silos. Well, well at so, that so point, at that point, you, to yes, yes, just Mr. Carmody, I'll, I'll, I'll cheat. At that point, you've triggered now. Mr. Carmody's made the offer, so we'll take that official to come to the table. Um, we'll be very brief, Senator, if we can, um, but it might help um, explain a couple of things. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Mark Sullivan. I'm the head of client services and aviation medicine branch within CASA. Um, the question that's been asked of me is to describe the various tiers of licences and the uh, medical certification standards that apply to each. What we have in Australia, and this has been mentioned by uh, Mr Carmody already, is five levels of medical certification, four of those of which are administered by CASA. Uh, the other level of medical certification is a self-declared driver's licence standard, which is um, applicable to RAL's pilots, but is administered by the uh, road traffic authorities in each state and territory. 
The four uh, levels of uh, medical certification standard that we have at CASA, uh, all that are administered by CASA are the, um, which is uh, the RAMP C. Uh, I won't spell out what it actually stands for, but it's a, it's a modified Osroads driver's licence standard, and it's an unconditional one. Um, only conditional to the fact that you uh, permitted some eyesight correction. There's the basic class two, which is the unconditional Osroads commercial driver's licence standard. And then there's the class two, which you're uh, familiar with already, the class one. And uh, we have a class three, which is for air traffic controllers. Uh, but in terms of pilots, there are the, the, uh, those, those four, the ramp C, basic class two, class two, and class one. The, f the uh, levels of licensing in Australia, uh, the, um, we have the, the, the certificates which are administered by uh, RAOs and, and not uh, within CASA's scope, but we administer the recre recreational pilot's licence and to that attaches a number of endorsements that permit uh, the operator of the aircraft to engage in certain flying operations. They start out with a very constrained set of privileges. Um, such as only flying within 24 to 25 nautical miles of the aerodrome from which they departed and the direct route to the training area and back in, and in between. Then they get endorsements that enable them to extend their privileges. One of those is a controlled airspace uh, endorsement. Um, to operate an, on an RPL, you, uh, you only require the RAMP C, the, the uh, driver's licence standard. Um, you can operate on a class two or a class one if you want, but that's a much higher standard than it's required. A PPL is the private pilot's licence, and that's the subject of a lot of the discussion today. The private pilot's licence can operate on the ramp C, the basic class two, the class two, and the class one. So all four levels of medical certification are available to a, a, a PPL. Once we get to a commercial pilot's licence, not only is the, the standard of training and the standard of uh, competence a lot higher, but so, so too is the medical standard, with one exception. So the, uh, the, uh, the base medical standard is a class one, that's a commercial standard. The class two is available to those commercial operators or commercial pilots that want to exercise their privileges in a non-passenger carrying environment. And this is key because it enables very experienced pilots that are no longer able to hold a class one to now deliver their services to industry through the operation, of a class, operation under a class two. The final level of licensing is the airline transport pilot's license, the ATPL. Uh, that, uh, that is the, the highest standard of license in Australian, um, in Australian legislation. It carries some very complex privileges that are associated with it and it allows the operation of very, very complex aircraft and systems, and that requires a class one. Class one is the very highest um, medical standard that's available to us. Now the question has been asked about a self-declared medical, and um, the, uh, the operation of such in other jurisdictions. Um, were we to go ahead and just uh, issue a self-declared, uh, or permit a self-declared driver's licence standard in Australia, we would have the most liberal um, medical certification standard in the world, because not even the US and the UK permit a self-certified, a self, sorry, rather a self-declared medical certification standard out of the gates. What they require first is the pilot or the applicant to pass the gate, to, to get through um, what they call an airman class three, I think it is in the US, uh, under FAA. They require a, they're required to meet a standard first. And more to the point, if, they can, if they've previously been refused or cancelled, then they've got to be reassessed against that airman's, airman's uh, standard. So they can't just go straight in and uh, obtain that, um, that, that self-declared medical. Um, that's also um, uh, applicable in the, in the UK, where um, they do have a self-declared standard that's available for certain limited operations of uh, what, are, what are called um, non-EASA aircraft, and these are things like gyroplanes and microlights and um, there's some home-built aircraft and warbirds and th th certain warbirds that, that fit certain criteria, but these, um, these are very limited uh, types of aircraft that could be operated under a self-declared medical, akin to what's available under RAOs. Uh, sorry. Thank you. I think that's given us a good overview. I'm, I'm going to go to Senator Steele now and they'll drill down into those parts. That they, no, you, there's no escape for you, Mr Sullivan. You remain at the table. Senator Steele. Thanks, Chair. So if someone can help me out here, let's say we've got old Farmer Barry out the back of Queensland there, who's got his plane and it's got a VH on it or whatever it is. 
So if he gets to the stage where his medical uh, testing gets too tough, why does he have to... Why can't he just take off the VH and then self-assess? Like you do with RAOs. He can, but it means the next day, if, if I can help drill, he can do much less. No, I understand that. Yeah, all right. I get that. No, I get that. Why does he have to go and join RAOs? That's what I'm leading to. Why can't he, you people do a deal all around the place and say, well, OK, we're going to make it as easy as possible. Promise you're not allowed in controlled airspace. You're not allowed to fly at night. You're not allowed to have any more than one. You're creating a monopoly, I think. That's what I can see. Um, pardon? Yeah, great. Perhaps I can answer that, going, uh, Senator Sterl. Um, essentially, there's two registration schemes currently in Australia. There's a VH registration that we are managing at CASA, and then there's a REOS. Um, there's nothing to say that you couldn't have a third player come into that mix if that was the solution that was, if there was demand for it. And I think that's the issue. So, you know, it's difficult for us to, we obviously want to have some visibility of aircraft operating in the country. And, you know, if everybody's got their own register and has only got their, their aircraft on it, that's problematic. I think, so, Mr. sorry, Mr. Crawford, I'm, I'm trying to be quick. We're on trying to get in my head. So we've got RALs and we've got Airline Owners and Pilots Association. I own a bunch of cowboys. They're, they're, they're respected organisation, years and years of experience, all that sort of stuff. Why aren't they good enough to just, for their members, just to get a bit of wet and dry it and get the VH off and put something else on it? Why do they? You haven't convinced me why they have to go and join RAOs. There's no framework. It's, it's an association, Senator. It's got, there's no safety management yeah. system. They don't oversight the maintenance of their members. They don't audit their members. They don't do all of